Hello, welcome to workshop number five, housing environment. The impact of the housing project on the environment throughout their life cycle. Our speaker for this workshop are engineer Manfred Brown, director of environment sustainability, University of Cape Town, and Dr. Isaac Akinovi, senior lecturer, Convenant University. Convenant. So thank you everybody to just joining us in this uh, afternoon. So uh, very briefly, I just try to explain the CEO project for those people they are just uh, joining us and missing the previous uh, workshop and just have a little more time to other people just uh, joining us. So the CEO is just standing for the sustainable, innovative, affordable housing. And in the CEO, we just try to <clears throat> Uh, develop interdisciplinary network and partnership uh, to respond effectively to complex housing challenges in Africa. We know all about the housing problems, so I'm not just repeating those things, but very briefly, only 13% of the people around the world, they're just living in the affordable house and only 55% of the 45% of the people in Africa living in the adequate housing. So it means 55% they're living in inadequate house. And we have a 150 million houses backlog in the Africa as estimated in 2019. So the rationale for the CEO is just uh, come from the idea of solving the complex multidisciplinary challenges for the design construction of the affordable housing cannot be solved by the expert profession and the policymaker working away in the silo. So we just try to empower the local stakeholder and community to redevelop or to improve the habitation, infrastructure and service condition of affordable housing project. We have a four objective in the CEO. The first is just establish an interdisciplinary uh, platform for the African uh, housing stakeholder. The second is just introduce the latest innovation technology and uh, technique. The third is train next generation of African researcher, innovator and collaborator or the problem solver. And the last one is just engender technology transfer and capacity development between the Africa African academics and industry. So we just try to make a bridge and fill the gap between industry and academic. CIA is just addressing directly or indirectly these 12 SDG uh, goals. I'm not repeating them. And uh, CIA is just founded by the Royal Academy of Engineering and sponsored by the University of the Cape Town, NHPRC of the South Africa and Ap Agreement South Africa and is just hosted by the Sustainably Oriented Cyber Research Unit for the Built Environment, which is just standing as a queue. As of now, we have more than 20 uh, partners coming from the uh, different academic institution, government agency, and some NGO worldwide. Uh, we successfully uh, hosted four uh, workshops, the four, first workshop housing finance and policy, the second housing design, the third housing market in Africa, and the last one or the fourth one is just a housing construction and today we are just trying to do the fifth one. But I just tried to give you a very short summary, one slide per speaker. So Ms. Samson, the head of the Department of the Human Settlements, he just explained the different factors uh, for the sustainable house. Uh, the sustainable house is the place to live. We can just work, connect to the playing area and just connect it to the learning area. So we call it sustainable house. Uh, Ms. Ross from the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa, he just, she just explained the condition of affordability of the housing in Africa. As you see, the map of the Africa is just more red or the orange than the green one. So it's just showing the majority of the housing is not affordable. Even the cheapest uh, newly constructed house is not affordable for the majority of the people in Africa. So there is a problem with the affordability of the house. Uh, Mr. Company, the head of the construction management city of the Cape Town, uh, he explained the, the process for the human settlement delivery process and he just showed the minimum time for the uh, 
housing delivery is just more than three years in the very, in a very good uh, chance, but sometimes it's just go to the 15 years. So there is a lot of red tape. There is a lot of overlap process there, which we need to identify those things and just try to minimize those things or remove it. Professor Lizardo from the University of the Montreal, he just explained about the importance of the housing. Uh, based on him, uh, building a house is not a challenge, but creating condition for the living uh, individual and the social group uh, happily is just a challenge of the uh, affordable housing. He just gave uh, some like uh, consideration or the recommendation how we can just uh, work on the uh, housing uh, affordability in the South Africa. For example, we have to work on the social justice, include the informal sector in design and construction of the housing, sustain engage of the, all the stakeholders, not just uh, only community participation, consider the flexibility and uh, adaptability in the both design and construction and stop trying to simplify housing issues. So we need to just uh, recognize the housing issue is a complex and then we just try to solve this complex problem all uh, stakeholders together. Uh, Professor Abu Ramadan uh, from the University of the Middle East, uh, she explained the importance of the, um, those specification or the factors we need to consider for design in the, um, uh, Africa. So affordable house or the sustainable affordable house is the house is safe and secure, comfort, social uh, context. We need to think about the stability, durability, flexibility and modularity and independent constant energy. So this is the very important uh, specification we need to consider along the other specification which are not uh, considered here or just added here. Professor Byron from the NHBRC explained the three level of the uh, design in the South Africa uh, and explained all the parties involved in these three levels. Uh, Mr. McCoffin from the uh, Urban Real Estate Research Unit uh, explained the housing market in the South Africa and he just shared the, uh, his research that uh, housing market in South Africa is not healthy. So it means the development cost is more than the value. He explained the value may be differ across the city, but costs are similar because of the superstructure cost, substructure cost, and services is just the same thing. So only the difference between the low cost affordable house and the high end house is just a matter of the fitting and finishes. So we need to just think about that one and how we are just try to fix this uh, affordability of the house. And he just gave us some intervention to just reach the uh, CEO or the uh, sustainable, innovative, affordable house. For example, ensuring infrastructure capacity, facilitation development right, innovation in the small scale of the finance, innovation in design, innovation in the building materials and innovation in the technology. So we need to using those kind of uh, innovative technology in the house to just minimize the operation costs. In the next uh, workshop, Professor Marici from the University of the Johannesburg, uh, he explained about the innovation in the housing and he just bring very interesting term of industrialized building system, which we can just shift from the mass production to the mass customization. So that's the very important things he just shared with us in the previous uh, workshop and he gave us some like a recommendation how we can just uh, enhance the industrialization of the building system like partnership between the public and private sector using the prefab and modular structure invest in the cutting edge manufacturing equipment and uh, innovate industry with the sound research and development and uh, lastly, Dr. Omotario from the Leeds Bucket University of the UK shared some quick? Uh, oh, okay. on, uh, with us uh, on the new social housing project. So we just suggested to use the central such as the BIN in the housing project in Africa as well. We just uh, develop a building um, accreditation rates, which align with the BIM, which we know uh, the South Africa housing industry is just working on that one. Establish a cost database for the easier cost analysis of the sustainable innovative housing. 
and more application of the modular building or the prefabrication. And the lastly, include affordable, sustainable housing and the BIM in the education sector. So we just train the students about those innovative information uh, modeling. Uh, so the next workshop is just a sixth workshop and it's just focused on the housing, social and well-being. We have a three excellent uh, speakers uh, coming from the South Africa, Pakistan and UK just uh, explaining about the different aspect of the housing and the role of the housing on the social well-being of the residents. SIA design competition is just open today, uh, so you can just visit the SIA uh, website and just get the more details, but I just very briefly explain something about the SIA competition. So the general specification for the housing is just we need to design a 50 square meter house which should be affordable for the African middle income group. We have the exact cost for that one, so you can just read about that one and should be innovative and sustainable house. The timeline today, we have started uh, releasing the competition brief and the information and the expression for the interest, it will be until the end of the uh, April. So we just collected those group or those uh, team that are interested on that one. Then we just evaluate the team and then we just start the competition design, which will be uh, ended the design period by the um, July 30. Then we have a judging period. And lastly, we have a CEO virtual com uh, convention and announcing the winner on October, 2021. So the first price will be 2000 pounds and the second price will be 1000 pounds. So I think that's the uh, good price for the especially young uh, students to just get the uh, good team together and just um, working on the CEO competition. And now we are just uh, focusing on the housing environment uh, workshop. Apology, we have a, a typo on the heading. So we have a two excellent speakers today. Uh, our first speaker is the engineer Manfred Brown. He's just the electrical engineer, is a director of the environment sustainability at the University of the Cape Town. Has a, a very uh, background, good background in the environment and especially in the Green uh, Council South Africa. And the next uh, speaker or the second speaker is Dr. Isaac Akunovi, uh, the civil engineer. He's a senior uh, lecturer from the Convent University from the Nigeria. Uh, without further ado, so we are just uh, starting with the uh, engineer Manfred uh, and uh, listen to his interesting uh, presentation. So I just uh, stop sharing. So Manfred, are you here? So you can just start your presentation if you're ready. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, I'm here. Just let me just see if I can share my screen. Yeah. Uh, can you see that, Ali? Yes, I can see that. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Ali, what I think I'm going to do, would you prefer me to keep um, the video on while I'm presenting? I don't mind. I'm just uh, thinking that there might be some connectivity issues, but uh, yeah. I can I can let, let it go for a while and see how it goes, or I can switch off video from the start. What do you think? I think it's better to just switch off your video. So in the case, if your internet is just not... Uh strong enough we don't have any problem okay okay great i'll i'll do that um shortly after my introduction thanks i just put your cv in the chat so everybody's interested to know more about the manfred the cvs in the chat great thank you thanks ali and um i'm gonna aim for 30 minutes so that we do have some time for, for questions as well. Um, do you want to take the questions after both presentations or straight after my uh, presentation? 
you know, we are just collect their uh, question, then we just go for the Q&A at the end of the second presentation. Okay, great. Okay, so um, thank you for this opportunity. It's great to be here. Um, I wanted to just start with a brief introduction to myself, uh, less of a CV and maybe just some personal background to my sort of passion for the environment and sustainability and the built environment. Um, just a reminder, if you can all just uh, make sure you are muted. Um, I can hear some voices in the background. Ali, you can also mute um, from your side. Uh, if you see any microphones unmuted, um, you can do that. Yeah, I will do that, sure. Thanks. Um, but so, so growing up, I grew up in uh, close to Chwani or Johannesburg um, and used to go on holiday as a family. I'm very lucky to be able to go to places like the Kruger National Park and really fell in love as a child with wildlife and nature and especially the, the rhinoceros uh, or rhino as I call it. Um, and at the time I was a teenager and really they were, um, the numbers were decreasing so much because of pollution. Um, that was in the early eighties. Those are kind of the, the statistics of rhinos. And, and I mean, you can see it's really radical and that really is where my love for conservation and uh, the environment started. And so I've really done my bit to also try and pass that on to my family. And we try and often go sort of spend time in nature and, and uh, really uh, enjoy South Africa and Africa in, in that way. Uh, but then sort of uh, my love that combined with my love for engineering and technology and so I ended up studying engineering at the University of Cape Town, which, which was also a great um, privilege. Um, I'm going to switch video off now um, just to help with bandwidth. Um, and there we go. Okay. Um, so quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about, give a bit of context to sustainable housing. And that's really sort of context for sustainability in the, in the built environment uh, more broadly, and then talk a little bit about the components of sustainable housing from my perspective, um, give some examples and talk about tools for measuring success uh, and very briefly looking into the future. And this is largely from my perspective, my understanding in the South African context. And also I must say, I'm not uh, working directly in the housing market as such. So, so there are certainly many more people who are more qualified than me to talk about housing specifically. Um, but my sort of area of expertise is quite broad in sustainability in the built environment. So um, yeah, I hope you, you find value in, in what I have to share. So I just wanted to start with really some broad context and I'm going to fly through this quite quickly. But this is really uh, sets the scene and it's quite important for us to understand the context, uh, at least in South Africa, but I think it's very similar um, around the world in many places. Um, we have incredibly rapid population growth and this transition of people from rural areas who are moving into cities. And so by 2050, um, this is a study by the World Resource Center, and that's then done by Ernst and Young as well, which is where this graphic comes from, is by 2050, um, we'll have this shift, complete shift in where the most of the population are in urban areas. And so, um, and most of that will in fact be from Asia and Africa. Um, then at the same time, we, have, um, let me just see, trying to see, transition slides, there we go. We have um, urban sprawl, and this is a photograph of the city of Cape Town, um, is a classic example of many cities around the world that have really just sprawled um, longitudinally further and further away out from sort of the core where, where often most of the work opportunities are. And um, that has then also led to uh, what's very typical in South Africa uh, and many other places, but especially in South Africa where we have very unreliable public transport uh, in terms of trains and, and those kinds of 
of mass transit systems. And so we have these very car centric cities. Um, we also kind of have a population uh, globally and in South Africa that is just kind of consuming and, and not just kind of shopping like this, but uh, consuming energy, consuming water, uh, producing waste. And so it's just this, this context of people in cities, sp sprawling cities, uh, very much uh, car centric and consuming heavily um, in, in cities. Um, at the same time, um, producing incredible amounts of pollution, whether it's in the air or in our ecosystems. These ecosystems are deteriorating um, and we have kind of uh, species that are going extinct. And, and um, this kind of often maybe isn't as noticeable uh, because maybe the species sort of weren't that significant to us, but the are certainly massive impacts and potentially greater impacts. Uh, if you just had to think, for example, of an area maybe where you have um, a lizard, particular lizards that are feeding on mosquito and those lizards go extinct. I'm just kind of simplifying the example, but you could potentially then have a mosquito explosion, which, which as you know, would be quite unpleasant, especially in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep and you have those mosquitoes buzzing around. But that that's just a, silly example, but really just uh, illustrating how the ecosystem is very sensitive. And if that goes out of balance, we really can't predict what would happen. So extinctions of species is really something to watch very closely and, and to do whatever we can to protect. Um, a massive issue, as we all know, is greenhouse gas emissions and climate change potential and impacts thereof. Um, I'm not gonna go through these links, but I'd really encourage you to have a look at some of these links on the slides. We'll share the presentation afterwards, but you can kind of have a look. There's some really interesting data here. Um, and then the other one that I'm not gonna show you here, but there's a really great um, video from uh, the New York Times <coughs> that gives a short, short summary on, on climate change, um, which is great to watch. This was a recent uh, extreme flood in um, Durban in South Africa, which is something we've never seen as extreme as this. And um, it's difficult to say whether these individual events were particularly directly as a result of climate change, but we do know that storms will be getting worse and more intense as the average temperature does increase. And the other thing that you add to that now, you have increased population, you have this pressure of um, more people needing to find land to live on and you have people finding places to, <coughs> to live that are then more subject to flooding. And so you have these kinds of um, things occurring, which, which really um, is in many ways quite, quite scary. Um, Resource, resource depletion is also something that uh, is really closely linked to this and will have a direct impact on the housing market is, is uh, all the resources that are needed to build homes and, and what happens in homes and as, as home occupiers, what we use. Um, just looking at two things that are continually going to be needed is iron, iron ore for production of iron and steel and so on and lithium think about all the batteries that we use and kind of the big drive for electrification. Um, lithium, there isn't sort of a, an infinite amount of lithium out there or iron ore. And this, this is just two examples. There's many out there. So really we have to think about um, our resources more sustainably and, and really think about them in a more circular way. Uh, and that's critical to the housing market as well. Um, food security is also really closely linked to housing and how we deal with that. This photograph was taken uh, from a retired police officer who, who realized how many people were without food and he planted uh, these gardens on the street verge uh, that people could literally just come past and grab uh, some food, uh, which this was in Heidelberg in South Africa, which is a great example of somebody trying to make a difference in a small way. Um, in our context, something that really has impacted housing and mass rollout of housing severely 
is uh, the apartheid legacy and spatial planning sort of impacts thereof. And, and um, this photograph kind of really just illustrates that um, sort of contrast of we've got this incredible natural beauty and, and most of the people who are either wealthy or not extremely poor live sort of closer to the mountain and closer to work where is, is but the poorest uh, in the city live, live furthest away. Um, just, just kind of looking at that uh, apartheid and, and kind of what that was that really specifically dealt with this was the Group Areas Act, which was basically forcing uh, people of certain races to be um, uh, only allowed in certain areas where the, it was living or kind of um, a movement and those kind of things. So. Uh, to undo that is really, really difficult when you have infrastructure and communities that are now um, living and sort of uh, fixed in many ways into that. Um, this, this image just illustrates the, the long-term impact of this now. I mean, it's been over uh, 26 years that uh, we've come out of apartheid and, and moved far away from that, but the spatial impact of our cities is very much still felt. So here you have uh, the highest residential density, uh, mostly um, as a result of apartheid and that um, uh, moving those masses into those areas. And obviously that's expanded over time. But uh, then if you look at where most of the employment is, that's nowhere near um, where most people in the city are living. And, and this is very common in, in most of South Africa's cities and a massive challenge um, that is part of our context that we really are trying to deal with at the same time as just providing basic housing to, to every person. Um, so um, that really kind of just sets a bit of the scene for the South African context and, and not that it would always be too different in, in other places in the world, but I think uh, apart the apartheid legacy certainly uh, is very specific to our context, but I think in many places in the world, it's it's not too dissimilar where you have people living often very far from work and often because of property prices uh, rather than, than our legacy, uh, often one has to live further out from the city just because there it's more affordable to live. Um, so in that sense, it's quite similar that, that you have people living very far away from those work opportunities. So then just wanting to touch on components of sustainable housing. Um, uh, firstly, I kind of wanted to start just with sort of uh, the community environment and, and where, where are those actual housing units located in terms of the community fit and what is that environment and how conducive is that um, to living. Um, one looks at things like uh, easy access to amenities. Um, this is the area I'm privileged to stay in, in, in Cape Town called Kirstenhof. And you kind of just look at Google Maps and all those amenities and shops and schools and police station uh, and churches and things like that uh, in close proximity. And I think very importantly, a Nando's, I don't know if anyone knows Nando's chicken, but that is uh, accessible, which is great. Um, safety is a, is a key issue, um, especially in South Africa where our crime rates are very high. Um, violence against women is very high. And so safety is really important for sustainable housing and, and sustainable living. Um, energy water access, but also sort of having that at a low cost, but also ensuring low consumption is really critical. Um, these are two pictures from a project I was involved in in Cato Manor uh, when I was still at the Green Building Council, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, waste removal is really critical and hard to deal with waste, um, and we certainly have some big challenges in much of South Africa. Um, and sadly, on the right hand side, this is how many in our townships are having to, to live in terms of um, bathrooms or toilet facilities, uh, which is really not, not acceptable and, and, and something that has to change radically and as quickly as possible. Um, 
The other component that's really critical is uh, looking at the materials that are used and the durability. Um, this is just an example of a home in the Karoo, which is a very arid, hot, dry part of the country and gets really hot during the day and then gets really cold at night. And so um, that's quite an unusual uh, sort of context and much of South Africa experiences that. So also the walling construction is really critical. How do you uh, design and build walls that can deal with uh, massive diurnal changes uh, from day to night? Um, and this also means that we can't just always pick up solutions from other places and assume they, they would work. Uh, as an example, I did a very detailed study on 10 different walling types um, in about 10 years ago and, and was really interesting looking at different cities in Cape Town and the key things that uh, from a sustainability uh, were impacted by that. Things like your um, energy costs during operation, thermal comfort is really huge. Uh, and then also the um, carbon footprint of those materials was very interesting. Um, health is a key component in housing that we really also need to focus on. Uh, so that is obviously from an outdoor air pollution perspective, where we locate uh, our housing developments, but then also from an indoor perspective, what kind of environments are we creating and are we creating sick buildings? Uh, mold is a massive issue in, in South Africa in particular, where we have many very poorly constructed homes and we have uh, not just mold, but we have uh, many homes without ceilings and as a result it makes the the impact and the potential for tuberculosis much higher um, which is really uh, a big challenge for South Africa. Um, daylight and external views also really key to creating healthy homes um, something that we need to focus on as well. Um, then uh, probably not so much but Legionella in water systems, hot water systems is also something to be uh, careful of and to consider. And then also asbestos in homes, uh, especially old homes, is something really to kind of be uh, careful and considerate of. The last thing in terms of components uh, it, that I wanted to highlight of sustainable homes is, is really the importance of being connected to a community and, and something that will make your home livable. Uh, is the community that you're in. That's your family and friends, your income opportunities nearby, um, affordable food, access to that in the neighborhood. Um, talked about water and electricity, but being connected to that. Um, schools at all levels, uh, right from the youngest to uh, tertiary, having access and being connected to healthcare systems and services, social services really are critical, often are neglected and forgotten. And then your public transport systems that can move people around. Um, then I wanted to just highlight, uh, sort of focus in on two aspects uh, within these that I think are really critical globally and, and that probably need to be addressed most urgently, but uh, with greenhouse gas emissions, I think buildings are about a third uh, globally of carbon emissions. And in the city of Cape Town, that's actually almost double that, 59% of carbon emissions in the city of Cape Town. This is um, sort of a graph from a while ago from 2017. Um, and you look at the residential sector, that's about 22% of the city's total emissions. Uh, buildings you'll see make up then the total of 59%, uh, but really significant to note how big that proportion of residential buildings is in terms of carbon emissions. And then the other one that I wanted to just highlight is um, your water, water and how big uh, that is as a percentage globally in the domestic uh, aspect. So 10%, which is really significant. Um, Something that I also just wanted to touch on briefly was um, green buildings are not something new. Um, and so for many years, for centuries, in fact, uh, people have been building incredibly uh, sustainable and comfortable homes and using local materials. Um, this is an example of a Zulu village near Shawi. Uh, this is another example, Koi Koi. 
settlement in the Cape. And these were actually very interesting little houses that were actually mobile. So they were able to pick that sort of unit up and carry that a uh, few of them to a different location. And um, materials were kind of really very carefully selected. Um, you can see those kind of grooves and that allowed air during the day to move through and they had kind of those coverings. Um, and so really kind of were appropriate for that environment. And so it's, it's not new, but something happened. We've kind of lost um, in many ways the ability to design buildings efficiently. And I think a big reason for this is the invention of the air conditioner. Uh, it's all too easy just to throw an air conditioner onto a building and, and kind of make it comfortable in that way, whether it's cooling or heating. Um, and we have so many buildings with so much glass, far too much glass often. Um, and for that reason, we have, especially in our context in Africa and South Africa, buildings that are just too hot and that have to be pumped with uh, air conditioning. And then the last one that I've kind of have experienced in many ways myself working as an engineer on many projects, the time and cost pressures are often huge. There's just no time to really consider different options and uh, consider uh, sort of something maybe that's a little bit more expensive that will uh, be uh, cheaper in the long run. So there are huge time and cost pressures uh, when developing. So I really uh, want to just highlight the, the critical need to um, go back to passive design and to look all, at all of those ways that homes were built centuries ago uh, and to bring those back into your housing design. Then I wanted to touch on a few examples. Um, and I'm really just gonna touch on these, not go into detail on all of them. Um, and, and the question I'm asking, and I'm not saying that um, these are all sustainable, but it's really just a question of whether is this a sustainable home? Um, here's a home example of an eco brick, which is basically, uh, something you've probably all seen, we're collecting waste and putting it into those empty Coke bottles and making something out of that, in this case, a home. Um, there's always sort of, uh, I think, pros and cons. And one of the challenges with this is mass production and uh, sort of supply, rely reliability of supply, and all sorts of other issues, whether it's actually a durable product or not. Um, is waterproofing an issue or not? Um, how thermally comfortable is it in the end? So those are all kind of things that have to be tested before one kind of says, yes, this is a, a really appropriate solution. Um, but uh, nevertheless, a great idea and, and very innovative. Um, sandbag homes, uh, you might've seen these. This, this project was a great example of where this worked really well. Um, uh, this was, designed by MMA Architects Freedom Park, um, really did a fantastic design um, and yeah, illustrated that this can work. The community was very involved in, in making up these sandbags um, and the result is, is quite incredible. Uh, container homes is also something that uh, there's very sort of uh, interest is growing in South Africa. These are two South African examples. Uh, the one on the right, you'll be able to click. Uh, this was um, a competition from the city of Cape Town that was recently won by uh, this group who designed this container home, which is two containers and basically wrapped with um, crate uh, timber pieces that uh, you'll be able to look at the video. Uh, if you click on this blue link, um, there's a little video sort of walk through the actual constructed house that has been on show in uh, Greenpoint Park in Cape Town. Um, the other example I wanted to give is the uh, option of refurbishing old and existing homes. Um, I was involved in a project with the Green Building Council a couple of years back at Cape Town Manor uh, that I mentioned where we, we basically took about 50 homes, um, low cost homes that were then uh, converted with solar hot water, with um, LED and fluorescent lights and ceilings installed, rainwater capture, um, vegetable gardens, and uh, we, we kind of put in place a maintenance contract that it would help and support them 
over the years to come so that uh, with these new technologies, uh, we wouldn't just walk away, but there's some continuity in, in supporting them, looking after this kind of new equipment. So it's been a success in many ways, but it is it's quite difficult to roll this out in communities. And, and so it's really hard as one to do this on, on mass. Another project that I was involved was a sort of a showcase of a sort of middle income family that won this competition for their house to be refurbished. You can have a look at as uh, a number of videos that and sort of useful tips and so on. Uh, but this picture on the left shows you um, how much energy they saved in a year, 48%. Um, 45 percent water and then 81 percent of their waste to landfill which is quite an uh, incredible achievement for one uh, small family um, in a middle income house um, feel free to have a look at that but again just a different example of what a sustainable home could be um, then also looking at kind of sustainable homes have to be in sustainable communities so um, here are some examples from uh, Baldwin properties who are developing these massive um, gated communities in a sense. And um, some of these, there are up to about 3000 units, uh, apartments in um, one development. And really importantly, what they've focused on is always in every development, creating a um, sort of entertainment space with a swimming pool and space for for families to relax and connect um so in many ways they've been quite successful and and have um sold properties at quite a diverse uh, price range which has made it quite successful in different markets um i briefly wanted to touch on um tools for measuring success um but firstly why do we actually need tools to measure success and i think it's really about how do you compare apples with oranges and how do you know that uh, a house has built been built to a sustainable standard um, and who says it's sustainable and so uh, the Green Building Council uh, and councils around the world have have become uh, recognized authorities on this and then also your your typical um, Bureau of Standards like we have South African Bureau of Standards our Bureau of Standards has only developed a standard for energy thus far. Uh, and so in terms of sustainability more broadly, our industry has had to rely on the Green Building Council to um, look at sort of broader sustainability standards for buildings. And so um, these are a couple of them that are in use. And so this is the Green Star multi-unit residential um, standard. So uh, a building at the University of Cape Town on the left which is a student residence has recently been certified. Um, and then on the right is an apartment building in Johannesburg that was also certified using this standard. Um, then another standard um, that maybe isn't, uh, it's, it's a lot simpler. It only focuses on energy, um, water and embodied energy is EDGE. Um, and I think in many ways that's developers kind of enjoy the simplicity. Um, just to highlight Green Star, then also focuses on additional elements like health, indoor environment, uh, ecology. So you would typically put Green Star in a basket like LEED or BRIAM, other global green building systems that are sort of looking at green buildings holistically. EDGE is really what one calls a resource efficiency tool. Um, then one also has standards and tools for neighborhoods like Green Star Sustainable Precincts. Here are two examples of certified precincts. Oops, sorry about the, the red lines. I'm not sure how those came about, but I'm almost done. Um, so Eco Districts is another framework that cities are starting to use. Um, here is uh, Salt River and Woodstock in Cape Town. Um, where they've been looking at the eco districts framework from a city perspective to really help them um, replan that district. And similarly, Johannesburg is also looking at this for the Orange Farm District. Um, very briefly, looking into the future, um, I've really just got two last slides to show here is something that is going to transform the residential market, but it's just kind of in that state of waiting for costs to drop mostly for storage costs but 
the round renewable energy. Um, and as soon as those storage costs drop substantially, then I think we're going to have a revolution. And, and there might be some other incentives, I think, that can come about. But I think the big one is, is storage, because we typically need the energy at night uh, when we're not at home. I mean, when we're at home, rather than when it's there during the day when we're not at home. Um, so kind of the next, what's next and what's kind of also in the future is net zero, for example. Um, this home is designed by Mark Sherrod, a South African architect. Um, they achieved a net zero carbon, net zero water, ecology and waste, sorry, not waste, but ecology um, certification for this um, small housing development. I think there were four housing units. Um, uh, sort of built on a flay above a flay. It, it was a, a sort of a manufactured flay, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then kind of next would potentially be net positive or regenerative homes. So uh, really some, some exciting things, I think, on the horizon. But um, I think the challenge is doing that en masse. And so uh, I'm not here necessarily to, to present all the answers, but really to give some examples and hopefully kind of inspire a little bit of what uh, can be done. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of end there just with one quote from uh, one of our South African heroes, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, in his words, he says, it is in, our, in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Um, so yeah, let's do this and let's work together to, to see how we can roll out mass sustainable housing. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Manfred. Your presentation was very, you know, informative. And I just see a lot of uh, information. You link it to the previous presentation, like the location of the housing in the uh, two or three workshop. We're just talking about that kind of the importance of the location of the housing, the accessibility, the safety, and all those things you just explained uh, about that. So you just also highlighted that one very well. Uh, the other things you just highlighted is just a passive design, which is just one of the uh, main criteria for the uh, CO competition as well. And I believe your presentation is just gave a lot of good tips for those groups that are just interested for competition, how they just use the age, because the age is just getting a lot of good uh, tips for the people to just see the design is how many person is able to just efficient or saving energy. So that's the very uh, excellent uh, presentation. I think I have a two pages here, notes, which I'm just trying to uh, pass it to my students, uh, which they're just working on the uh, housing. Recently, we have some sort of like a, a big number of the students start working on the CEO and the sustainable innovative houses. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. And yes, uh, I have some uh, interesting question in the chat. So I just collecting those uh, question and just uh, ask you after the second presentation. Great, thanks Ali. Sure, thank you so much. So we are just moving to the our second uh, part, which is just, uh, Isaac, he just explained about the housing environment and he just gave us some like and more information about the importance of the design and uh, characteristic of the housing and the environment. Isaac, it's yours. So please start your presentation. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, I'll also want to thank uh, Manfred for that excellent presentation. Let me share my slide, please. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, I'll be presenting on housing development in Africa and its impact on the environment. Uh, my name is Isaac Akimumi and I consider it a great privilege to be asked uh, by our host, Dr. Ali, to make this uh, presentation. 
Uh, in this presentation, I hope to briefly highlight how housing crisis is a global challenge, show the development in housing in Africa and the challenges posed to the environment, how to minimize the impact of the challenges and make housing development in Africa more sustainable. The population of people in the world has been on the increase. Uh, just as mentioned by Manfred, it is estimated that uh, global population is currently around 7.9 billion people, and it will be near 8.2 billion people by the year 2025, and about 9.74 billion people by 2050. According to the United Nations, about 55% of the current global population of people live in cities. And it is expected that this figure will increase to 68% by 2050. And as seen in this uh, video, which is an animation of uh, the population growth in the biggest cities, the population of people in cities has been on the increase with uh, the city of Tokyo being the most populous city in the world. By the year 2100, African cities will make up 13 of the top 20 most popular cities in the world. This will include Lagos in Nigeria, Kinshasa in DR Congo, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Khartoum in Sudan, Niamey in Niger Republic, Nairobi in Kenya, Lilong and Blantyre City, both in Malawi, Cairo in Egypt, Kampala in Uganda, Lusaka in Zambia, Mogadishu in Somalia, and uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. According to the United Nations Habitat, UN Habitat, about 1.6 billion people in the world are without adequate housing. About a billion persons live in slum worldwide and over a hundred million people are homeless worldwide. And by the year 2030, UN Habitat estimates that 3 billion people, which will be about 40% of the world's population, will need access to adequate housing. The increasing prices of properties is making it difficult for people to purchase houses. And globally, residential prices are rising at their fastest rate in nearly three years. The recently released Global House Price Index shows that 89% of countries or territories experience year-on-year -year increase in house prices from 2019 to uh, 2020. Turkey, for instance, with 30.3%, uh, had the highest rate of annual property price growth in the year 2020. South Africa also experienced a 3.5% uh, price increase. Also, increasing house rent is making housing more and more unaffordable and causing many people to live in substandard or insecure houses. 30 cities in the world considered to present the best deal of opportunities to its residents were ranked based on their rent to income ratio. It was found that cities with um, greater than 30% uh, rent to income ratio are having houses that are unaffordable for renting. And you have some of those cities to include Tokyo in Japan, Hong Kong, Madrid in Spain, Stockholm in Sweden, uh, Amsterdam in the uh, Netherlands, Jakarta in Indonesia, uh, Chicago in the US, uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, London in the UK, and up to Lagos in Nigeria with 57% and Mexico City 60%. The global housing crisis is already resulting in many challenges, such as development of slums, homelessness, unaffordability of rent and electricity, increased poverty, unhygienic living conditions and health problems. 
Another challenge is reflected in the submission of the UN human rights expert that the global housing crisis has led to mass human rights violations. Just like Africa's diverse culture, its housing styles or forms are so diverse. From history, Africa's housing style is patterned after its communal culture. Our buildings are usually within and around clusters of buildings. Also, the materials for building houses in Africa include thatch, stick, wood, mud, mud bricks, um, rammed earth, stone, cement, concrete, steel, plastic, aluminum, and others. Several indigenous and modern technologies are employed for building constructions. And housing maintenance requirements are also diverse depending on the type of house you are considering. Uh, as one moves from rural areas to urban centers in Africa, the way houses are planned, constructed and maintained changes drastically. Constructing with sustainable materials does our environment and the planet a lot of good. Uh, It contributes to making housing more affordable by saving construction material costs. I'm sorry, I don't know what's causing the graphics on the on the slides. Uh, okay, but a sustainable material is one that does not deplete non-renewable natural resources and has no adverse impact on the environment when used. Consequently, some of uh, the sustainable material we use in Africa include, just as I mentioned earlier, we use mud bricks, rammed earth, stone, wood, sticks, and tar. These materials are available, renewable, and have lower embodied energy, that is the energy consumed by all of the processes associated with the production of the materials. On the other hand, the less sustainable materials used include cement, concrete, steel, plastic, aluminum, and others. For instance, the manufacture of cement and steel require high process energy and produces greenhouse gases. The transportation of manufactured cement, steel, aluminum, and plastic require high energy mode transportation. Materials used for construction in rural areas are more sustainable than those in the urban areas in Africa. Um, the materials in rural areas require little or no transportation for the construction to the construction site. When uh, construction is in, when transportation is involved, they typically use wheelbarrows, cart pushers, or bicycles that require no fossil fuel use. And construction in urban areas generate more waste than in rural areas. Africa is the most rural region in the world. Uh, more than 30 countries in Africa have more people living in rural areas than urban areas. Burundi, for instance, has as high as about 87% of its population living in rural areas. Consequently, Africa uh, environment should be less polluted. However, Africa is fast urbanizing. Urbanization is causing increased slum and illegal housing developments in Africa. For instance, um, the Kibera slum in the outskirts of Nairobi in Kenya is said to be the largest urban slum in Africa with more than 2.5 million people living in the slum. The challenges that people live, living in such slum face on a daily basis are only imagined than experienced, uh, or they are better imagined than experienced. Some of such uh, challenges include uh, poor waste management, lack of access to safe drinking water, little or no sanitation provisions, uh, poor educational facility, housing without um, finished materials, unimproved housing, among other challenges. 
Um, in a study, a study found out that uh, across all sub-Saharan countries, excluding South Africa, Comoros, and the desert areas, the prevalence of uh, houses that were built with finished materials increased from 32% in the year 2000 to 51% in 2015. Also, the prevalence of improved housing, that is, houses um, with improved water and sanitation, sufficient living area and durable construction, doubled from 11% in the year 2000 to 23% in 2015. However, an unacceptably large or proportion of uh, people still live in unimproved housing in urban Africa. How is housing or housing development affecting our environment in Africa? With increasing housing development, the land cover change is becoming obvious as seen in this uh, model predicting the land use land cover change between the year 2000 and 2015. The change analysis showed that impervious surface class, mainly artificial structures, including houses, had the highest relative increase from 2000 to 2015, while high biomass and rocks had highest decreases from 2000 to 2015. With a decrease of around 17% um, in the high biomass and rock, we can attribute um, such decrease to several factors including housing development. The contributions of housing development um, include building on land previously covered with vegetation and felling of trees that produce uh, wood for construction and furniture in houses. Loss of vegetation impacts adversely on the weather and climate. We all know that uh, plant processes and, and processes and release water vapor necessary for cloud formation and absorb and emit energy used to drive weather. Plants also produce their own micro weather by controlling the humidity and temperature immediately surrounding their leaves through transpiration. Also, rocks get continually blasted to produce materials for building houses. Another challenge of housing development in Africa is that housing with, without proper finishing and ventilation can contribute to air pollution and threaten the health of its occupant, especially children and old people. For instance, a, a family of uh, 12 were found to be living in a bedroom mud house at a remote spot in Kenya's um, countryside near Mawegu. In that condition, they were reported to have lost two babies before an intervention got them a bigger house in an environment like this one bedroom mud house, the indoor air quality may be poor with high levels of uh, particulate matter or carbon monoxide. Houses in some cities are so clustered together so that there's no space for proper ventilation. Electricity generator fumes from neighbors can sometimes flow into houses causing indoor air pollution. In our recent study on water sanitation and hygiene in the first 2000 days of life, we investigated the indoor air quality, particularly um, carbon monoxide and particulate matter levels in 70 formal and informal daycare centers in Otter, Nigeria. We found particulate matter concentration to be at levels higher than uh, standard WHO guideline values. This is a major concern because particulate matters are inhalable and can affect the heart and lungs. And some, in some cases, they cause serious health effects. And in fact, children are usually at greater risk from particulate matter exposure. Scientific studies have linked particulate matter exposure to a variety of um, health impacts, including eye, nose, and throat irritation. Aggravation of coronary and respiratory disease symptoms and 
premature death in people with um, heart and lung uh, diseases. It is also very worrisome that some houses are built in Africa without adequate provision for water supply and toilets. Lack of access to safe drinking water and toilets in many houses post or the post threat to um, public health. In some cities also, people build along drainage channels, causing flood and many problems associated with it. With poor enforcement of uh, city master plans in some cities in Africa, this practice goes on unabated. Coastal cities are usually associated with economic activities and opportunities. Consequently, these cities attract increased housing development. But such increased housing development around coastal areas can also result in regular incidents of flood. Considering Lagos in Nigeria as an example, the um, National Emergency Management Agency in Nigeria warned last year that no fewer than 8 million residents of Lagos State are prone to flood disaster. Floods can lead to so many other problems like outbreak of um, waterborne diseases, building collapse, attack of people by animals, loss of livelihood, mass displacement, among uh, others. Housing development must include proper plants for waste management. Another cause of uh, flooding is indiscriminate dumping of refuse in drainage uh, channels and prohibited areas. Uh, as shown by Manfred, some single-use uh, plastic that litter some of our streets can be productively used as building construction materials. Now, to minimize the adverse impact of housing development on our environment, we need to use more renewable materials and um, environmentally friendly methods for construction. We need to promote the use of uh, indigenous earth building techniques. Government must formulate policies to support uh, investment in low income housing. Um, government also must, uh, through its housing agencies, closely work with people in their communities while enforcing compliance with city master plan. Housing development should include provisions for water, sanitation, and waste management facilities. We need to make living in rural areas of Africa more attractive to provide um, essential by providing essential infrastructure in rural areas and linking rural areas and urban areas with good roads. Housing stakeholders need to focus on construction of affordable housing than luxury housing. Uh, government needs to invest in land and real estate in order to control house prices and rent. Government needs to also provide support for renters, especially during disasters or financial crisis. Uh, these are just a few thoughts from mine. I want to say thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. You just highlighted about the population, especially increasing population in the Africa. And I see some like a nice conversation and question in the chat is just happening. So we just uh, go to that one and just try to address on that one. But I believe next workshop, which is just uh, more on the social and well-being can just address that one better than this one. Uh, Isaac, you just mentioned about the method of the construction and those kind of uh, material we are just selecting for the housing. Uh, we have a similar case in the South Africa, the houses in the uh, rural area, they just constructed with the local material or the more environment friendly materials compared to the city. You know, when you just come to the city, you have a very limited option 
we are using is just more concrete cement, steel bricks, and we are not just trying to look at the uh, other option. We just try to maximize the uh, you know environments or uh, reduce the environment impact. Something like the re recycling materials, local materials. So there is a lack. There is a really lack about that one, especially in the context of the Africa, and we have to just address that. One. So now I just open the uh, floor for the Q&A or the comment. So uh, I'm not repeating the question. I asked the person to just uh, unmute and please uh, just ask the question. You have it. So I see some question coming from the Sonia. Uh, Sonia, if you don't mind, do you want to just ask your question directly from the Manfred and the Isa? Um, sure, Ali. Um I think for me, it's, you know, I, I tend to always ask the same question, but I think it's, it's a worthwhile exercise for me. Um, so for me, it's really about, do we provide the part or the whole? Does, 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 does a bigger move um, fix the whole rather than smaller, more costly moves? So, um, yeah, so my question is, what is a sustainable city and how do we achieve that? Now, someone um, spoke about population explosion and, and a whole lot of other things. Um, maybe for me, just to comment on that, when we look at the apartheid city, what the apartheid city achieved was that it prevented people from moving um, into the city from the rural areas using laws and using force. Um, but this is not a good way to do it because things want to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Um, so, so I'm really asking this question, what is an economic way to make big moves that are not costly? Um, one other uh, um, item I want to bring up is, you know, I see the sort of proliferation of solar panels. I see the proliferation of housing units. And to me, it just looks like a very costly, expensive exercise because how long, what is the lifespan of a solar panel? Is there a circular economy in a solar panel, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's really my question. What is the big moves um, that makes a just city or what is the big moves that makes a, uh, a just world in which there can be greater equilibrium um, between rich and poor, between those that are comfortably housed and those that aren't? Thanks. So uh, I'm not sure, Manfield or the Isaac, who wants to just uh, address that one? Um, I don't mind responding. Thanks, Ali. Um, Isaac is welcome to also respond. So, I mean, not that I have the answer. <laughs> I have an, an answer. I think cities are incredibly complex uh, in themselves um, besides the housing issue within cities. So cities have a lot of other issues um, within them. And obviously housing is a key component. Um, I'm just gonna give one example maybe of something that I think um, has that potential maybe to, to shift the housing market and the growth of the housing market. And, and again, I'll say it's just one example. And I think there's many examples um, uh, is kind of a more of a, community-led housing development um, process rather than a government-led um, housing development process. Um, and it's interesting to see that develop, sort of growing and developing in South Africa where you have within the townships, you have um, developers emerging in the township who are developing property and selling off um, units within township sort of context, um, selling decent housing units uh, at a rate that they know the market will buy. And so you have basically, you establishing, there's actually new businesses that are emerging, people that are emerging as, as property developers, um, is, and people are then selling or renting the property. So it's, it's less reliant on, on the city. Obviously, it has, it comes with all sorts of other risks that one has to address and, and one has to make sure these things are being developed to a good quality and all of that. But it is quite an interesting perspective to, to shift away from relying on the government for everything um, and to basically create more of a free market 
um, that basically creates an environment for housing development and then allowing the market to freely kind of go ahead and emerge and you'll see companies emerging um, in that market. So that was just maybe one comment I wanted to make on that. Thanks, Ali. Ali, can I just respond briefly? I'll be quick. Sure. Um, Manfred, my question just is, you know, allowing people to, to do this for themselves, that sort of organic approach. What do you say to the concern about um, cities like Sao Paulo, um, where 75% of the population live in favelas, basically in slums, in kind of self-regulated areas, and all the rivers are basically open sewers? So it's, you know, it's kind of tantalizing to see, to say power to the people to do their own thing. It's a bit like sweat equity on a mass scale, but what are the infrastructural implications of doing that? No, so what I, I mean is, is not, not uh, everyone just uh, doing what they want. What I mean is a free market of developers, property development emerging in the townships. They still have to obviously comply with the law um, the city still has to get involved in providing maybe certain bulk infrastructure like they would do on any other development. But I mean, when there's um, 2,000 homes that need to be built uh, in an area that is not done by the city uh, through a city kind of process where the city are designing those units, the city are kind of selling those units or renting, that it's kind of um, basically there's land that's passed on to developers to then drive or yeah so it, it's still within a managed and a regulated context but not relying on government to actually do the development itself thanks, thanks. Isaac do you want to add anything to this question or yes let me just add that actually um, there's no quick fix there's not just one solution for every uh, please, we must make both the big moves and the small moves at the same time. Uh, everyone must take responsibility and ownership of um, trying to make our world a more sustainable world. Uh, some of the small moves must be regulated and the big moves should be also coordinated by governments and its agencies. Uh, for instance, in slums, there and in many rural communities where there are no basic amenities, governments can wade in, provide such basic amenities that may reduce the influx of people from such rural communities to uh, urban centers to crowd uh, slums and live in places on hygienic conditions. So that's my little contribution to that um, question. I hope it helps. I think you just highlighted very important point, you know, the, the both side, they need to just move, they need to just uh, collaborate, talking together to just solve the uh, problem. So that's the things we just try to do it in the CL, to just break the silo, to fill the gap and bridge between the private and public. Uh, yes, and also I just see some previous speaker, they just talking about the importance of this public-private, not only in the design or construction, also in the finance or any part of the housing issue should be to just come and just uh, work together. Uh, the next question I think is coming from the Helena. Helena, do you want to ask that question? Thanks so much, Ali. I'm looking forward to next week. It sounds as though it'll be more relevant there. Um, like um, like the, the, the second speaker said, and thank you very much for those presentations, this is going to be a lot of different solutions to get to the end result, uh, spanning you know, across economic, social spheres. But the biggest thing that always just strikes me as strange is how there couldn't be initiatives privately and from government to try and curb um, population expansions. So just at the beginning of the second speaker's um, presentation just highlighted where we're going to be in another 70 years and it's, I don't think it takes a genius to see that it's of the wrong direction um, and it's going to create massive problems on top of problems. So it just strikes me as strange how 
in so many different spheres, no one's ever talking about population growth as a potential area to try and resolve these desperate shortages of uh, homes, food, medicines, education, everything. It's just an unresolvable issue the bigger we grow. Yeah, yeah that, that's the very important part, you know, but it's just go to the more social aspect, you know, that's, uh, I'm not sure we can just answer that one, but we know uh, the rising of the population in the uh, poor infrastructure or in the poor area is just not valuing of the people, it's just adding to the problem. So that's the things we need to just do that. Uh, I know that Manfred has another meeting to leave, uh, so I'm not sure, Manfred, do you want to just put your last uh, tip or something about the uh, housing environment or the competition before you leave? Thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I wanted to just encourage uh, those that are joined um, through the innovation that is happening and that I can kind of see a lot of around me. And I think that to me is encouraging where you see examples and, and the example I shared with the city of Cape Town's competition, the My uh, Clean Green Home, uh, is a great example of a reasonably low cost i think that was under 300,000 rand um for that sort of two container house um and sure it's not uh, always uh, what everyone likes in terms of architecture or design um but that's just an example of the i think the exciting innovation that is out there and that people can bring um and so I, yeah i just wanted to encourage uh people to to participate in the competition. I think that's really what it's about is, is sharing innovation and getting creative and uh, coming together with solutions. Um, and as Isaac said, there's not one silver bullet. This is a combination of many big and small solutions that have to be uh, rolled out. There's different, many different stakeholders that are involved. Um, yeah, so it's a complex problem but that's why we put together great minds and we work together on this so Ali thanks for the opportunity thank you so much for your time I know you are very busy and I really appreciate your time uh, thank you so much so if you want to leave please uh, take your time and just uh, because I know you have to attend another meeting by half past two great thanks Ali thanks, thanks everyone thank you so much uh, the next question here is uh, coming from the Olabisi. I hope I just pronounced it correctly. Uh, do you want to just ask your question, Olabisi? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for um, all presentations. Uh, my question is about the materials for construction and why we don't seem to discuss as robustly as possibly we should uh, about the choice of materials for construction for mass housing. Um, such that we have uh, affordability in terms of not just uh, cost, but also design. And it seems that in African countries, especially, we seem to rely a lot on cement. And it's not actually the cheapest form of construction. And it is more or less quite a monopoly in many countries, especially in Nigeria, where I live. And I just think that it's something that we need to discuss. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Isaac, do you want to just uh, say something in that point? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Olabisi, for that uh, question. Truly, we need to be discussing about um, construction material choices. Um, uh, in Nigeria, just like she mentioned, there's this strong over-dependence on cement, uh, which is unsustainable. Uh, we need to begin to look at the use of, I mean, innovative ways to uh, use traditional building technologies, traditional materials, and use materials that our uh, four forefathers have used, but changing the forms, changing the styles in a way that it suits the modern day life so that it becomes attractive to people of uh, today. Otherwise, if we, when you talk about the use of local materials that are sustainable, many of uh, the new generation people will not want to look 
to take such route or such options because they see it as unattractive, is um, aesthetically not pleasing to the eyes. They look at it as primitive. So we need our architects, our civil engineers, we need to change the way we teach uh, construction materials. Our curriculum should focus more on local materials and encourage, give students practical uh, situations or practical classes or examples where they themselves get involved in using some of this local material so that they can recommend it, they can use it, they can. We need to also come up with standards for the use of some of those materials. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was mute. So you highlighted a very good point about the local material. So maybe the young generation or the young professional, they just thinking when we just talking about the local material is just the, uh, those material, we just try to get it uh, like a previous generation and use that one. But uh, recently we are just do a lot of innovation on local materials. So we are using the clay, but in the different formats of the blocks, or maybe we just add some like a recycling material to just solve the two problems, using the local material and also solving the problem of the waste and recycling some of the waste, especially like a plastic or some of the uh, waste material coming from the big industry like a mining. So there is some like uh, interesting uh, research is just happening. And I just try to organize maybe one workshop to just focus only on that kind of area. We have that uh, interesting research in the UCT, which we just try to develop the block from the sand, the combination of the sand and the URI. The other uh, interesting topic is just recycling uh, plastic to use in the 3D printing, which is just happening in my department. And I'm just aware of that one or just recycling the best of the mining material for again, using in the prefabrication or the 3D printing. So there is a lot of um, good uh, research is happening, but still is just not coming out because of the long process of the regulation and the testing for the construction material. So that's the one of the barrier and the challenges for the innovator uh, is just happening. And especially ISOC, he just highlighted that one. So we have only a few minutes left and we can just go for one more question. Uh, the next question is coming from the Tatenda. If I'm just pronounce it correctly, please excuse me if I'm just not pronounce it correctly. Uh, is he or she's here? Uh, I'm here. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Ali. Thank you, Isaac, for the wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask that, uh, how do we make uh, my question is particularly for higher tertiary institutions. So how do we make sure our universities are sustainable, both on the buildings and on the environment? And how can we upgrade them to the level of sustainability to create a great green star rating? And uh, yeah, basically that's my question. I said, please. Okay, thank you very much, Tatenda. Uh, yes, that's a, a very important question because um, universities must lead by example. Uh, yes, many of the universities, I'll say, they are trying in one regard, in the regards that many universities, you see, plant trees to offset the uh, global warming and making sure that the environment is green and the landscape is beautiful. But when it comes to the use of um, local materials, when it comes to the use of um, sustainable materials, yes, we are still lagging behind generally in Africa and not only in Africa, in many other parts of uh, the world. Um, also, infrastructure provisions to we, the universities in many, in some parts of Africa still lack infrastructure. 
you have houses, uh, hostels still lacking uh, basic infrastructure like um, good toilets for proper sanitation, um, waste management, wastewater management, wastewater recycling. We do, we are the university, many universities are not engaging um, the university community to produce a more sustainable environment in terms of recycling of wastewater, re, um, reuse recycling of waste materials for productive use like housing and many other infrastructure. Then also, just like I mentioned earlier, our curriculum in um, the universities and higher education institutions need to change. We need to focus more on, and I think that's a major aspect that will help in transmitting uh, the our cultural heritage to the younger generation. I hope I have briefly answered uh, the question. I know that that may not be exhaustive, but I think I've touched on, on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac. Yes, you are just very right. And Dr. Matoyo, in the previous session, he just mentioned about the changing of the curriculum. He was thinking about the innovation and just adding those kind of innovation teaching in the curriculum, especially for the engineering and built environment, like a building information modeling or the modular system. That's exactly the things is happening. And the difference in the African university compared to the other part of the world, we need to change the university to a live lab. So let the students to just experiment. If you are just talking about the local material, there is no uh, harming anybody if we just let the students or let the designer construct one of the building in the university with those approved standard local materials to just showcase the culture and the material. You know, that's the things we can just do that one. And this is, I believe, the proper way of the teaching, not only the academic and the theory of the teaching. Let the students or they let the community see the advantage of passive design, let them to see the advantage of the local materials, let the students involved with the design and construction of the houses, like a residence or the building. So they just learn it and just do that one. This is the things we just try to do it in the U city. So we just try to make a, like a simulation project and just more uh, practical uh, choice for the research, not only the theory of the research, especially for the people in our department to just do that. I want to just appreciate uh, all the attendees uh, in this afternoon. So we have a very interesting conversation and presentation from the two excellent uh, experts in the housing environments. And I encourage everybody to just participate in the housing competition. Even if you don't want to just participate as a uh, people to just design, maybe you can just sit as a mentor and just helping the young and emerging uh, you know, researcher or the professional to just uh, come and just learn something during the process of the competition. I was involved with the two set of the competition with the city of the Cape Town and the other one, the previous one with the zero energy in the Morocco. Honestly, I believe a lot. I uh, learn a lot. I cannot believe I learned maybe more than the university and the colleges I attended. I learned from these two competitions when I just collaborated with the electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, with the QS, with the designer, architect. So I just learned a lot personally. So I uh, appreciate and I just value this kind of competition. Thank you so much again. So shortly, I just try to add the presentation and record to the CEO website. So you can just get the copy of the presentation of these two excellent uh, slides and also the video. Uh, the next workshop is just in April 14. If you have time, please just join us for the uh, workshop on the social and the well-being. Thank you very much. Keep safe and see you all uh, maybe next workshop. Thank you very much, Ali, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Arisa, for the time.